Next, on AM 1480 WLEA, the Newsmaker Show, here's Ryan O'Neill. And here's Dr. Bob. Good morning, folks. Dr. Robert A. Heineman, Alfred University Professor Emeritus of Political Science. Thank you. Well, good to see you. Let's, uh, let's start out today talking about Joe Biden, former Vice President, former Delaware U.S. Senator. Yes, yes. Uh, Mr. Biden uh, has entered the race. Um, and uh, just as an aside, it appears uh, I don't think Mayor de Blasio is going to take too much of his support away from him. <laughs> That's, uh, the Mayor de Blasio. You're uh, not the only one yeah. who's been making fun of uh, no, the de Blasio just, campaign. Yeah. Oh, brother. But at any rate. Uh, They're uh, laughing less at Joe, though. Indeed. Uh, Joe uh, has uh, pushed out to a pretty hefty lead over um, Bernie Sanders. Uh, and uh, what's kind of interesting, I noticed the other night somebody was saying that in Pennsylvania he has a 15-, 20-point lead over Trump in the, in the polls. Of course, he sort of claims Pennsylvania as his home state since he comes from, I think, the Scranton area or somewhere around there originally. But be that as it may, uh, he's moving right along. Now, there's a number of factors to consider here. Uh, one, can you remain a front runner uh, with this kind of lead for the next uh, 15, 16 months? And I think it's a relevant um, concern whether he can keep that kind of lead and uh, st- stay as a front runner. Because what will happen, of course, is the other candidates will start. Uh, going after him in a variety of different ways, and I th- he has his he has his certain his vulnerabilities, and uh, when you let turn him loose on the uh, campaign trail, he'll probably increase his vulnerabilities even more. But I think uh, the one concern here uh, is that what do you have now? Twenty twenty one people in the race, and uh, as that winnows out, uh, these uh, supporters for uh, some of these marginal candidates, the question is, where are they going to go? So uh, Biden could have a 20, 30-point lead on uh, Bernie Sanders. I don't think he has that much. I think he's up 10 or so over Bernie Sanders. But these other candidates might well drift toward Sanders, and uh, that will uh, sort of tighten the thing up pretty fast. So that's that's the real question right now, where these uh, marginal candidates support uh where that's going to drift off to. Uh, Uh, Dr. Bob, can I pop in? Go right ahead. Mark Cuban. Yes. Says nobody on the Democrats' list of candidates can beat Trump in 2020 at this point, right now. Well, uh, Mark Cuban, uh, who is Mark Cuban? He owns, who, what, the Dallas Mavericks or? Yeah, big shot bazillionaire. Yeah, and, uh, but I don't know if he's won any elections lately. And, uh, I'm not certain what he really knows about American politics. Uh, that doesn't mean he can't uh, spout off. Anybody can spout off. but uh, uh, that's Chris Matthews, in talking about Elizabeth Warren, Elizabeth Warren bowed out of doing a Fox town hall. She was going to do it and then bowed out of it, uh, calling Fox News a bunch of racists, etc. Elizabeth Warren, uh, according to Chris Matthews, is smart not to do the Fox town hall. What do you think? Well, I don't think it would go particularly well for her. On the other hand, if she has some programs and positions that are pretty strong, uh, she should be able to do all right on Fox News or wherever she is. I think her problem is that her positions and issues aren't particularly popular and aren't uh, that well thought out, and uh, so it could get pretty embarrassing pretty fast. Plus, I don't know whether she would be wearing her native headdress in there or not. I mean, uh, that uh, is always going to be a problem for her. Can we talk about uh, President Trump, the investigation into the investigators? Yes. Well, I think that's really quite interesting. And uh, apparently Attorney General Barr now has appointed a special prosecutor uh, who has done some pretty heavy investigation as a special prosecutor in, in other areas. So uh, nobody uh, doubts this guy's capabilities. So the question is, where did these rumors, these Russian collusion rumors, uh, begin? Who started them? Uh, Why were they started? 
uh, what kind of uh, political motivations were involved. And I think one of the questions is, uh, did the FBI, in fact, uh, put surveillance on the Trump campaign team? And uh, was the FBI actually uh, involved in uh, trying to um, make the uh, Trump campaign less effective than it was? Spying but, on the campaign. Yeah, I guess you could put it that way. And there's quite a bit of evidence that, in fact, they were doing that. So this guy Durham uh, will be looking into that, and I think there's going to be some pretty embarrassing results. Not that the media will pay any attention to them because they don't want to embarrass the Clintons and uh, some of these other people. And possibly Obama? Possibly. Well, yes, absolutely possibly. Some conservatives say that Obama was a hands-on guy, liked to be involved in everything, and it's impossible he didn't know about all this. Well, I don't know about that exactly. Uh, and I'm not certain he was all that friendly with, with Hillary Clinton and the Clintons, to put uh, be truthful. But uh, uh, I, I do think that uh, you know, Eric Holder and uh, Loretta Lynn is... Uh, Loretta Lynch, I guess, not Loretta Lynn... <laughs> Uh, his uh, attorney generals were pretty much aiming at uh, the uh, so, sort of uh, African-American uh, position in, in a lot of these political situations. And obviously uh, Obama and his people didn't see and don't see um, Trump as a, a strong proponent of uh, civil rights or uh, black rights one way or another, despite the tremendous gains that uh, African Americans have made in the job market over the last two or three years. So it's it's quite possible uh, there's some... Uh, Doc, can I ask you there. about that? About that. Well, some conservatives uh, go as far as to say is the Democrats uh, want to keep uh, minority groups in the Democratic voting block and that they want to keep them uh, poor. Do you buy that? Well, uh, I'm not certain that any Democrats uh, consciously or deliberately move to keep people poor, but they have had a real success in this rhetoric of uh, speaking toward the poor and uh, providing uh, services for the poor and things of that sort without actually doing anything effective in terms of increasing uh, the uh, position of the poor, improving the position of the poor, so that under the Obama and the Democrats generally, uh, the, the unemployment among the poor, uh, the huge increase in uh, um, single uh, parent families and welfare rolls and things of that sort have been, you know, have been pretty clear under the Democrats, and uh, the uh, attempt to try to get people off. Uh, the welfare po polls and uh, roles and to get them off of dependency uh, is not a Democrat uh, priority. In fact, as you're pointing out, uh, the Democrats, you know, they have a huge consensus there among uh, welfare workers and this whole uh, not-for-profit area that sees themselves out there as doing good. And, uh, in fact, uh, it becomes a situation where they're doing good ends up providing jobs for themselves. Uh, not that they're not well intentioned. I think they probably are. And when you say providing part. job for yourselves, you're talking about uh, bureau bureaucracy. Right. Providing. Exactly. Exactly. Fighting a war and just fighting the war to fight the war and keep it going so that right they right. have a job. Right. Um, and I just think they're oriented in the wrong direction there. And uh, so yeah, short I'll of a project, very toss, go around, record someone without them knowing it. And getting the top Democrats to admit that they'd like to keep certain segments of their voting population poor. I don't know how you could ever prove a statement like that. Yeah, well, I don't know about that, but uh, you can certainly look Not at Not yours, the, but the statement that the Democrats like to keep everybody poor. Yeah, well, I think you can look at the results of their policies. And uh, in that respect, uh, that's where Trump and uh, his administration has uh, just totally broken down the barriers there in terms of... Uh, providing jobs for people across the board and uh, that but of course that doesn't include jobs to any great extent for the people in the welfare bureaucracy and, and, and those kinds of areas. 
Talking to Dr. Robert A. Heineman, uh, Alfred University Professor Emeritus Political Science. Governor Andrew Cuomo said about Twitter, uh, said on Twitter, oh, about the anti-abortion uh, rulings and things going on down in Alabama and Missouri. This is what Cuomo said. New York feared that these anti-choice measures would happen, and that's why we codified a Roe v. Wade in New York State. Other states should do the same as New York before the Supreme Court rolls back 50 years of precedent on women's reproductive health. Should these other states be imitating New York State? Uh, I think not, uh, but I'm not saying we should be imitating the other states either, to tell you the truth. I, uh, I don't think Roe v. Wade is, is going to be overturned. Uh, even though you've got some people on the court, I think, who would very much like to do that, uh, the idea of uh, the precedent and the tremendous uh, effect that the precedent has had, I think, carries a lot of weight. Whatever your position on uh, uh, the abortion issue uh, directly, uh, but I do think uh, that there will be uh, some continued nibbling away at uh, the Roe v. Uh, Wade standards, and again, uh, the, the the states like Missouri and. Uh, Alabama and I believe Louisiana or Mississippi, I'm thinking Louisiana, are moving toward a much more drastic um, anti-abortion positions. And I think that, you know, that pushes it, again, way too far as well. Um, so uh, Roe v. Wade, you, you may not like the, the fundamental principle there, but it's uh, been... In place a long time, and it uh, does give uh, the uh, states the right to step in at a certain point and uh, prohibit abortions, and they've been doing that. And under the Roe v. Wade standard, it was in the third uh, trimester the state could step in, but now it's moved closer to the point of conception, uh, with the idea of at what point has is life sustainable outside the womb, and that can move. Uh, beyond uh, the third uh, third semester. But I think you have some serious problems with the pro-choice position, uh, one of which is, of course, the whole idea of selecting, deciding whether to abort uh, uh, fetuses because of their gender. And uh, in places like China, which had the one-child policy, although they're backing off that a little bit, uh, you, got, you have this huge... Uh, imbalance now between uh, male and female people uh, and uh, in most uh, where the, the uh, birth rate goes naturally over a period of time the population tends to favor women not by a whole lot but uh, maybe two or three percent and in China in some of these areas you've got 120 men to every hundred women and uh, that's uh, that's kind of that skews the whole thing, uh, but you know, in this country, I guess uh, you have a right, in New York at least, uh, to go in and just abort the uh, fetus simply because you don't like the gender. You want to raise a little basketball team or football team or whatever, uh, you you've got a right to go in there and uh, abort it. Yeah. And now you know a lot of physicians are not going to do that. I, I mean, they certainly they certainly are not, they, even if. They basically are pro-choice. I mean, I there aren't many physicians that are going to make that decision. But nonetheless, the law allows it. Uh, and uh, then, of course, you got the whole question of rape and incest and uh, health of the mother and things of that sort, which do, uh, do give some issues about the, the pro-choice people. So, you know, it's a very deep and complicated issue. But to come in there, like some of these states are doing, I don't think that's helpful either, frankly. Doc, can I talk quickly on the uh, pro-life videos that have been coming out of the state of North Carolina? Well, I guess. I don't, uh... Okay, a couple of videos have been uh, coming out of North Carolina that North Carolina pro-life college students have been taking. Uh, female college students um, losing their tempers with pro-lifers. These, In both cases... These uh, college girls in North Carolina have been arrested for stealing pro-life signs and punching pro-lifers. Question. Uh, okay, you, you know, we're talking about teenage girls here, girls late teens, early 20s. 
Can left-wing professors be blamed for the fact that these students go out into the world while they're still in college and lose their minds practically? You should see these videos of them hollering and screaming because they disagree with someone. Yeah. Well, I think uh, you've got plenty of left-wing professors out there, and uh, they uh, think basically that they're uh, propounding the truth. So I guess if they convince the college students that they are uh, on the uh, right side, so to speak, it does give them uh, some uh, rationale or justification to be pretty nasty. But I don't think anybody um, should promote uh, violence of any kind and anything beyond, you know, direct confrontations and things of that sort. You certainly should be free to argue these positions. But, uh, again, you've got some, you know, college professors and pundits of other sorts that are yeah, somebody's care. stirring these kids up too much. Yeah, I, I don't really blame don't these care. girls. They're hearing an overload of this kind of information that if anything upsets them, they're going to lose control of themselves. That's silly. They shouldn't be teaching kids that stuff. I don't know. I'm I, I'm retired. <laughs> well, Doc, we're going to uh, we're going to go into a little safe space ourselves and take oh, a break. Okay, I'll go out and have a cigarette and. St. James Hospital is a convenient local option for tests like colonoscopies and endoscopies to diagnose and treat digestive issues. Using the latest techniques, our highly trained physicians perform diagnostic scope tests right at St. James Hospital. Your primary care provider can make the appointment for you or call 385-3820. We'll get you in quickly and you don't have to wait long or travel far. So next time you need a diagnostic scope test, give us a try. Visit stjames.urmc edu for more info. Back with Alfred University political uh, science professor emeritus Dr. Robert Heineman. Yes. A uh, big question on a lot of people's minds. Uh, Iran. We've got people over there from the military. Uh, lots of stuff happening. Bring us up to date on it. Well, uh, as far as I can tell, uh, what seems to have set all this off, and there's probably more to it than uh, what we've gotten in the media. Uh, is the fact that they have uh, identified um, pseudo-government boats, and I don't think they're part of the Navy, with missiles on them uh, f- moving into the uh, uh, Gulf there between um, uh, Iran and along the Iranian area there. Uh, and this has, I think, a lot of the elements of kind of the way the Russians approach the Ukraine sending in uh, volunteer groups of one sort or another who were uh, basically uh, tied uh, to uh, various elements in uh, uh, eastern Ukraine and uh, arguing, well, no, no, we don't have anything to do with this. This is simply uh, a popular kind of uprising, non- non-government uh, supported. And I think the Iranian, uh, by sending these, these ships out there, and I'm not certain you could call them ships, I don't know how large they are, but apparently they do have uh, missiles on them. And uh, the idea that they they fire off a few here or there, especially at cargo ships, uh, things of that sort, they could cause a heck of a lot of damage. And Iran Iran might be able to say, well, hey, that's that's not us. That's terrorists of one sort or another. So I think uh, that's what we're responding to. And how far the Iranians are going to push this, I don't know. But again... The thing that concerns everybody is uh, John Bolton and how much he's going to push this. Bolton has been trying to invade and bomb Iran for the last 20 years. And now he's in a top uh, policy position, uh, international security. Ron Paul's been questioning that. Yeah, well, I think he's uh, Paul there is, is absolutely uh, on target. Um, and uh, the question is how far Trump will put up with this. I don't think Trump... Uh, Trump wants to get us out of the Middle East, and certainly engaging with Iran uh, militarily is no way to get out of the Middle East. So uh, I think at some point, Bolton might be on his way out. Uh, let's hope so. Can I ask a question that I asked uh, Dr. Nick Wadi the other day? Yes. A lot of stalling on the U.S. Uh, getting out of Syria. Trump wanted uh, the troops out of Syria, and it has not happened yet. He ordered it months ago. Uh, Nick Waddy seemed to think that this was a victory for the neocons and the establishment uh, that fights uh, Trump and that Trump has kind of acquiesced on this one. What do you think? Well, I don't think I'd put it quite that way. 
Uh, I think uh, Trump uh, tends, as we know, tends to come out with very strong positions. And then uh, once he's given uh, input both sides in uh, different ways, uh, he will, in fact, back down. But uh, I think we have pulled out uh, most of our troops out of Syria. I, I, again, I'm not quite clear how many we have over there yet. But we've always been... Uh, uh, clear that we were going to keep troops there or in Iraq for some time. And uh, so uh, there has been some drawback there. And as far as I can tell, the, the fighting and such has, has dropped down dramatically. Uh, certainly ISIS has been pretty much wiped out. And that's really what Trump wanted to do, as did an, any number of other people over there. Certainly plenty of places for... Uh, new fighting and violence to flame up, but uh, I think it's quieted down. I think uh, it's a little dangerous to put all these decisions in terms of Trump, anti-Trump, infighting in the Trump administration, whatever. I think, uh, frankly, uh, these guys look at the facts and the data and they come up with different interpretations. His name is uh, Dr. Robert A. Heinemann. If you look at RateMyProfessors.com, you see a lot of positive comments. That's a long time ago. Hey, this is kind of interesting. Um, <laughs> to whom? Says that more, you're more, you were more of a lecturer. Says you wrote maybe three words on the chalkboard all semester. Not a big PowerPoint guy, no. Uh, that would be right, yes. <laughs> if they just remember those three, I'm happy. <laughs> Did you check a little question? Did you change your notes every year? No. I uh, Years ago when I was in graduate school, I had a professor, Daniel Berman, and he was an excellent lecturer, and he said, uh, you write up your notes and never change them. Yeah, I had a teacher like that at Hornell High School, Glenn Thomas. I remember students who were older talking to students who were younger, and it was very similar notes, but it was a heck of a class. Yeah. Well, absolutely. But, uh, once you get it set and your framework set, then uh, you stay with it. And uh, the point is, over a period of time, you realize that certain things play a lot better than others, so you kind of... Modify and, slightly, uh, yeah, but yeah. hone things down a little bit. But yeah, by the time I finished up 53, 54 years of teaching, why I had them pretty well polished down. Did you have a word for word, or did you go no, by... No, 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 no. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Wrote down little notes on index well, cards, no, maybe? I had my lecture notes there, and kids would ask them for my... Ask me... In this class with all my lecture notes, I'd show them to them, and they'd kind of shake their head and say, well, that's all right. <laughs> that's what uh, a student said to me once when uh, he asked for the notes because he missed the class. He looked at my notes. He said, no, thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Different reason, maybe. Well, maybe.